Okay, welcome everyone. I'm just going to get started. Sorry for the delay. So today I thought I would do a guided meditation practice. Um, you know, really I, I expect whenever I give a teaching um, that it's somehow related to the meditation practice and therefore useful in a practical sense. But I thought I'd go over some of the the techniques that we use in the actual meditation practice. First I wanted to give a little bit of food for thought and this is relating to a conversation I had about the description of Nibbana and um, it was suggested that I give a talk on Nibbana and maybe I will but I'd like to read something here that I think is um, very useful as food for thought. The problem with talking about Nibbana of course is that um, you're talking about something that is unlike anything else and that's what this passage um, starts by saying. So you, you, you can't um, you know, describe its size, shape, duration, etc. You can't describe it in terms of conventional reality or in terms of constructed reality because it's unconstructed. But here in this Buddhist text called the, the debate of King Melinda, the Melinda Panha, the questions of King Melinda, who was a Greek king. Uh, in ancient times, after the Buddha had passed away, but he became a uh, a supporter of Buddhism. He was a part of the Greek Empire. Uh, he's he's um, equated with the Greek king Meneander, I believe. And he came and, and had a series of debates with a Buddhist monk called called Nagasena. Nagasena was a, an enlightened monk in the in the time. I can't remember exactly how long after the Buddha had passed away. Okay, so the passage starts with the king asking a question about nibbana, and he's been asking some some quite difficult questions and, and something about Nibbana and then he goes on to ask is it possible Nagasena to point out the size, shape or duration of Nibbana by a simile? And Nagasena says categorically no it is not possible there's no other thing like it. The king asks again is there any ab attribute of Nibbana found in other things that can be demonstrated by a simile? And Nagasena replies, yes, that can be done. And he goes on to give uh, several similes, which I think are, are very good food for thought. Whereas we can't put this into practice. It kind of, um, what I think the great thing about talking about Nibbana does is it helps us compare our experience of reality with this um, unconditioned state or unconditioned reality. And so we can see that, that what we experience in our daily lives pales in comparison. And so he says, as a lotus is unwedded by water, Nibbana is unsullied by the defilements. Like water, Nibbana cools the fever of defilements and quenches the thirst of craving. Like medicine, it protects, thing, it protects beings who are poisoned by the defilements, cures the disease of suffering, and nourishes like nectar. As the ocean is empty of corpses, Nibbana is empty of all defilements. As the ocean is not increased by all the rivers that flow into it, so Nibbana is not increased by all the beings who attain it. It is the abode of great beings, the, uh, the enlightened beings and it is decorated with the waves of knowledge and freedom so here he's comparing the ocean um, the, the whales and the um, 
great beings that live in the ocean with the great beings that attain Nibbana. Like food which sustains life, Nibbana drives away old age and death. It increases the spiritual strength of beings. It gives the beauty of virtue. It removes the distress of the defilements. It relieves the exhaustion of all suffering. Like space, it is not born, does not decay or perish. It does not pass away here and arise elsewhere. It is invincible. Thieves cannot steal it. It is not attached to anything. It is the sphere of the Aryans, who are like birds in space. It is unobstructed and it is infinite. Like a wish-fulfilling gem, it fulfills all desires, causes delight and is lustrous. Like red sandalwood, it is hard to get. Its fragrant fragrance is incomparable and it is praised by good men. As ghee is recognizable by its special attributes, so Nibbana has special attributes. As ghee has sweet, sweet fragrance, Nibbana has the sweet fragrance of virtue. As ghee has, has a delicious taste, Nibbana has the delicious taste of freedom. Like a mountain peak, it is very high, immovable, inaccessible to defilements. It has no place where defilements can grow, and it is without a favoritism or prejudice. And then the King Melinda goes on to ask about the realization of Nibbana. How then do you realize it if it's totally unrelated to everything else? You say, Nagasena, that Nibbana is neither past nor present nor future, neither arisen nor non-arisen, nor producible. In that case, does the man who realizes Nibbana realize something already produced, or does he himself produce it first and then realize it? Neither of these, O king, yet Nibbana does exist. The, the thing about Nibbana is it can't be produced. You can't create Nibbana. There's the realization of Nibbana, the, the falling into it um, by the cessation of all suffering. When everything else ceases, what is left is Nibbana. So you can't create it. It's not that we practice meditation and suddenly Nibbana arises in our minds. But so the king gets angry because he doesn't understand this and he says, Do not, Nagasena, answer this question by making it obscure. Make it clear and elucidate it. It is a point on which people are bewildered and lost in doubt. Break this dart of uncertainty. And Nagasena replies, The element of Nibbana does exist, O king. And he who practices rightly and who rightly comprehends the formations according to the teachings of the conqueror, the Buddha, he by his wisdom realizes Nibbana. How is Nibbana to be shown? By freedom from distress and danger, by purity and by coolness. As a man, afraid and terrified at having fallen among enemies, would be relieved and blissful when he had escaped to a safe place. Or as one who fallen into a pit of filth would be at ease and glad when he had got out of the pit and cleaned up. Or as one trapped in a forest fire would be calm and cool when he had reached a safe spot. As fearful and terrifying should you regard the anxiety that arises again and again on account of birth, old age, disease and death. As filth should you regard gain, honors, and fame. As hot and searing should you regard the threefold fire of desire, hatred, and delusion. How does he who is practicing rightly realize Nibbana? He rightly grasps the cyclic nature of formations, and therein sees only birth, old age, disease, and death. He sees nothing pleasant or agreeable in any part of it. Seeing nothing there to be taken hold of as on a red-hot iron ball, his mind overflows with discontent and a fever takes hold of his body. Hopeless and without a refuge, he becomes disgusted with repeated lives. To him who sees the terror of the treadmill of life, the thought arises, on fire and blazing is this wheel of life, full of suffering and despair. If only there could be an end to it, that would be peaceful. That would be excellent. The cessation of all mental formations, the renunciation of grasping, the destruction of craving, dispassion, cessation, nibbana. Therewith his mind leaps forward into the state where there is no becoming, 
Then has he found peace. Then does he exalt and rejoice at the thought, a refuge has been found at last. He strives along the path for cessation of formations, searches it out, develops it, and makes much of it. To that end he stirs up his mindfulness, energy, and joy. And from attending again and again to that thought of the disgust with mental formations, having transcended the treadmill of life, he brings the cycle to a halt. One who stops the treadmill is said to have realized Nibbana. Okay, so that uh, is a food for thought passage. For those of you who didn't understand Nibbana, in fact it can be a scary thing. Nibbana is the cessation of all of this. And we really love all of this, now don't we? And in the Buddha's teaching we realize that really that's the problem is our love for things causes us to create, causes us to cling, causes us to compartmentalize reality into the good and the bad and get all tied up in reality. And Nagasena in this passage he he says something that, that I always like to come back to and it's that uh, one who realizes Nibbana is like a bird flying in, the, in space, flying in the sky. And this really sums it all up for me. We're, we're like um, birds clinging to a tree, clinging to, um, clinging to the earth. And as a result, we're not able to fly. We think we're going to fall, we think we're going to, um, to perish if we don't cling to things. We think, how boring would it be to lose all of this? And because of our misunderstanding, we, 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 we repeat, it, repeat again and again the same mistakes and fall into suffering again and again and are, are unsatisfied on and on from life to life. The Buddha's teaching is not something that theoretical. It doesn't do for us to just read such texts and analyze them and uh, theorize about them and make up views and beliefs, say this is this and that is that and so on. Buddhism is a practice, it's a path and that's what he gets at at the end which I think is, is so poignant. This passage uh, is very well, very well said, very well written. The, the entire book is an incredible a testament to the uh, the wisdom of this monk and the wisdom of an enlightened being. So I'd like to invite everyone, um, please take your eyes away from the screen for a second. Let's relax our our minds. Let's put put down the burden for a second. Close our eyes and begin to settle down, begin to organize this, this great jumble that is our mind with all of its attachments and aversions, all of its worries and its stresses, its fears and its hopes. We see that the mind is quite a, a jumble of quite a jumble of different things, of mind states, thoughts, and judgments, and yeah, plans, and memories, and the experiences of the world around us. It can be a daunting task to even begin to examine this. When you close your eyes, most, most people are overwhelmed. What do I do? I close my eyes. I, I don't know where to start. People become quickly discouraged, saying, I'm, I'm not a meditative person. I'm too distracted. The truth is, if you're very distracted, it's a good time to start meditating, good reason to meditate.
but it, it's a good point that if you just start pulling and, and, and trying to untie the knots in, in, one, in your mind without any plan or any um, method, uh, you tend not to get very far. You tend to become uh, confused and disheartened with the sheer magnitude of the problem. So the Buddha had us split reality up. Really, this is what we do when we when we um, practice Buddhist meditation. The, the The Buddhist theory on on the meditation practice is simply splitting reality up into pieces and so that we're able better to recognize it. We don't just have to pick something. We can start to distinguish different states and recognize them more easily. So the most famous Buddhist meditation that occurs in the text, the most um, frequently um, taught by the Buddha, is the practice of the four foundations of mindfulness. And this is because these four things are a way of breaking up reality into into pieces, into categories. Not that we're going to judge one one or the other, we're just going to be able to recognize them easier. Rather than a problem comes up and, and we think of it as an, an entity. We have a, an issue that we have to deal with. Rather than seeing it as an issue, as a problem, which is totally un, unsolvable, it's invincible, it's an entity. We break it up into pieces and we see that actually there's a lot going on here. And some of these things are, are easily uh, overcome. Some of the causes for our suffering are easily done away with. If we attack them, if we examine them and uh, enlighten ourselves in, in regards to them. So these four foundations are, are something that is highly recommended to use, recommended by the Buddha himself as the Ekayana Magga, which means the only way or the direct way, the one way, the straight way, however you want to translate it. And so I'm just going to go through some of these, some of the ways we put the four foundations of mindfulness into use in our practice. For some of you, this might be familiar, but again, this is practical. It's not theoretical. We're not trying to learn anything in terms of theory. We're trying to uh, penetrate into a deeper understanding, a deeper practical understanding of reality. So the first one is the body. The body is, is all of the physical that we see around us. This is only a quarter of reality. The material world is only a quarter of, of, uh, of what is real in the universe. And yet it's 95% of what we focus on, what we uh, experience, what we relate to. When we see, it's something physical we're seeing. When we hear, it's something physical that we're hearing. When we smell, when we taste, when we feel, this is all physical. And yet this is only the tip of the iceberg, really. The problem is that we create reality. Even just sitting here, when we open our eyes, we create a reality with a waterfall and palm trees and people sitting on mats. We create this reality out of, the, out, of, out of the illusion that is created by, by, by light touching our eyes. Most of what we see when we sit here together is, is created in the mind. It's not a physical reality. Nonetheless, the reason why the body comes first is because it, it is for this very reason the easiest object for us to, to focus on because we're um, constantly aware of it. When we're sitting here, the, the easiest thing for us to
pay attention to is our physical body, sitting in the chair or on the floor. And so we start by focusing on what is what is most obvious. And when you're relaxed, when you're calm, when you're first starting to settle into the meditation practice, this should be the stomach rising and ceasing, uh, rising and falling, sorry, with the breath. When the breath comes into the body, the stomach should rise. When the breath goes out of the body, the stomach should fall. If you're not a meditator, if you're new to the whole thing, it, it, it might not seem to be the case for people who are stressed and unfamiliar with the technique of, of calming the body and the mind. You might find yourself breathing from the chest. But if you put your hand on your stomach, you can find it. It's the most obvious because everything else should be still when we're sitting. There are other things, of course. There's the, the feeling of the chair underneath us. This is physical. There's a sensation at the nose of hot heat or cold. This is physical. And you can pick any one of them. But really the most coarse and obvious should be the stomach once you get into the meditation practice. If it's not obvious or um, if it's difficult to find, you can lie down, lie on your back and check for yourself to see. You'll see that in a natural, in a natural state you breathe quite deeply with the stomach. Now the whole of the meditation practice that I was taught and that I therefore teach to others has to do with this concept of, of recognition, of acknowledgement, of reaffirming the true nature of the object, as opposed to letting the mind give rise to views about the object, conceit about the object, attachment to the object, judgments about the object. And this is in line with the, the, the suttas, where the Buddha says, Pati sati mataya anisito javiharati. And the key here is Pati sati mataya, which breaks up into three parts. The mata part, mata means um, only, or just to the extent. And sati is this recognition or remembrance. And the word pati means uh, specifically or only. So the, this 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 phrase is is what the Buddha is the Buddha's uh, explanation of what we mean by sati of, of mindfulness. We're not talking about any mindfulness in general or any remembrance, remembering the past or the future. We're talking about recognizing something specifically for what it is and only that. And so this is our meditation practice. When the belly rises, we just acknowledge that that's what it is. Keeping our mind from giving rise to a, a, a different sort of acknowledgement, that it's good or bad or so on. The judgment. When it rises, we say, we, we say to ourselves, this is rising. Reminding ourselves, it's not good, it's not bad. It's not me, it's not mine. And I guarantee this is the best way to see the, the object for, for what it is. Even just a short practice can give profound realizations and, and understanding about the object. You know, we always thought we knew that we were breathing when we were breathing. We thought we were already aware of it. When we practice this way, we realize we really are never fully aware of the object. We skim lightly over the surface and move on immediately to our our illusions, our delusions, our wants and our likes and our 
your attachments and aversions. And judging everything we come in contact with. So we remove all that. And we have a simple this is this awareness. When it's rising, we know that it's rising. When it's falling, we know it as falling. And we say to ourselves in our mind, just like a mantra, focusing our mind on the object, only seeing it for what it is. Rising, falling. Rising, falling. And what this practice does really is untangle all of the knots that we've tied ourselves up into, making so much more out of the present moment than it actually is, so much more out of the reality that we experience than what it is. We, we pull our grasping clinging fingers out of the out of the mess and we get closer to Nibbana closer to flying away fewer knots fewer cling fewer tangles that much more freedom and we feel it you can feel the relief not having to mess with this chaos that's inside and, and around, around us. No longer having to be a slave to your defilement. These uh, unwholesome states that we have, that exist in our mind. Our, our likes and our dislikes, our wants and our needs. And you can acknowledge other things. It doesn't have to stay with the rising and falling. If you feel at the nose, you can say hot, hot, or cold, cold, or feeling, feeling. If you feel that sitting in the chair, you can say to yourself, sitting, sitting, or feeling, feeling, hard, hard, or soft, soft. Just acknowledging the experience as you perceive it. Stopping the mind from judging it. This is the first foundation that the Buddha taught. It's a very important part of reality. It's the easiest because it's the most clear. The second foundation is the feelings or sensations. And these arise both in the body and in the mind. When you feel pain or when you feel happy, when you feel pleasure in the body or calm in the mind, This is, this is the breaking point if you examine the Buddha's teaching. The point where there arises The point where there arises um, suffering, clinging, 
the point where there arises defilement. If you look at the, the, the sequence of cause and effect in the Buddhist teaching, you see that it's when feeling arises that there arises clinging. Cr craving comes after these sensations. When we feel pain, we, 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 we give rise to a wanting, wanting for the cessation of the pain. When we feel happy, we give rise to a craving, wanting to the, the happiness or the feeling to be sustained. When we feel calm, the same, we enjoy it, think of it as a good thing. And when it's gone, we're dissatisfied. So there's nothing wrong with any of these three feelings, and that's the point, really, is to see that it doesn't really matter which feeling arises. There's nothing intrinsic about them that says, I am good, I am bad. And if we put these labels on them, this is where we, this is where the problem starts. We say this is a good feeling. And automatically, our our meaning is, and those other ones are bad feeling. We don't realize this. We think these are good feelings, and I'll just like them and and not be upset when they're not here, and not be upset when something other than that arises. And it can't be so. It's a partiality, it's an imbalance in the mind. The mind becomes partial to certain experiences. This is the key to the Buddhist teaching, is that you can't have one without the other. When you're partial to certain sensations, you'll be partial against certain other sensations. It's the nature of it. So this is very important in our meditation practice. And it's therefore the second foundation. Once we're watching the rising and the falling in the stomach, then we can start to see these other things. The first one we'll see is the, the feelings. We'll feel pain. And when we're sitting on the floor, you can feel pain in the legs or the back or the shoulders or the head or wherever. If you don't feel any pain, you might feel happy or you might feel calm. And we're going to replace all of this clinging, all of these uh, knots that we have were like tied up with ropes tied to the uh, the the wheel and we just see them for what they are we untie all the knots just in one in one moment all of the knots are gone we feel pain we focus on the pain and say to ourselves pain 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 no longer clinging to it no longer thinking of it as a negative thing negative experience when we feel happy, we say happy, 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 seeing that it is what it is. When we feel calm, we say calm, calm, calm. And we can focus on the pain for as long as it lasts, or the happiness as long as it lasts, or the calm as long as it lasts. When we do this, we'll see that they don't really last. They come and they go, not according to our wishes, they're according to their own nature. And when they're gone, we just come back again to the body, which is always there focusing on the rising and the falling, or whatever. When we're walking, focusing on the walking, movement of the feet, walking, walking. So that's two foundations. The third foundation is the mind. The mind in the, in the scriptures goes into, the Buddha goes into quite a bit of detail about it in terms of 
a distracted mind or a focused mind. And we can do this as well when we can see that there are many different kinds of minds that arise. When our minds are distracted, we can say to ourselves, distracted, distracted. When our minds are focused, we can say, focused, focused. When our minds are, dis are drowsy or tired, we can say, drowsy, drowsy or tired, tired. When we feel angry, we can say to ourselves, angry, angry, when anger arises in the mind. Just see it for what it is. This is the mind. You'll see that the mind is not really under our control. It's not permanent. It comes and it goes. It changes all the time. And we pull back. We pull back from this mess that is the mind. This is really the key. The body, the feelings, it's not so important. They're more of a tool to allow us to see the mind. Allow us to see what's happening in the mind and change all of that. So we no longer cling. We no longer have anger or we no longer have greed. We're able to untie these knots to, by focusing on them. This is the key, really. I think a lot of people, when they think of meditation, think of it as leaving behind all of this. But in Buddhism, we, we think of it as untying the knot. And the only way you can untie the knots is if you go right in there and grab them, start pulling, start straightening, start untying. And you have to do this at every moment. When you like something, you have to untie your your creation, your mental formations. This is good, this is bad, whatever it is, making an, an entire entity out of it. See it simply for what it is. So you like something, liking, liking. When you're angry about something, angry, angry, frustrated, bored, worried, sad, depressed, scared, confused. There's so many, and yet they, they're they so simple. All you have to do is remember their names, <laughs> really. If you can remember their names, then you can remind yourself of what they are. Then you can sort out all of this mess that is the mind. Normally when I talk about the mind, though, I, 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 I always focus, well, my teacher actually, would always have us focus simply on thinking. And this is because when we get to the fourth foundation, we're going to talk then about the, the states of mind, the, the, this, the nature of the mind. There's an overlap in the, between the two. So an important part of the mind is, of course, the thoughts. And this is really a very practical teaching. What does the mind do? It thinks can be good thoughts or bad thoughts, but it's always thinking. And we're not trying to stop the thinking, per se. We're trying to untangle ourselves, disentangle ourselves from the thinking, so that we no longer identify with it as, I'm thinking, this is my thought. And therefore I have to deal with it, I have to come to some resolution, I have to think it through, and we follow after it. And simply say to ourselves, thinking, thinking, seeing it for what it is. The fourth foundation, called the Dhamma, is a selection of the Buddha's teaching. It really is all of the Buddha's teaching. This means this is the meaning of the word Dhamma in this case.
But another meaning for the word Dhamma is reality. And so the really the, the, the point of the Dhamma is something that leads us closer to the greatest reality of all, which is Nibbana. And so the Dhamma here is, is a gradual teaching on the various parts of the Buddha's teaching, various parts of the path. breaking reality up into its component realities, component parts. So the Buddha talks first about the, the five hindrances which I've gone over, and these are the knots that we have in our mind, the reactions that come that I went over. We talk about the mind, they're, they're also a part of that. Liking, disliking, drowsiness, distraction, and doubt. When these come up, we should be very quick to acknowledge them. We must be very uh, determined in our minds to not tie ourselves in knots with liking, with likes and wants, with dislikes, with hatred and frustration, with boredom, with sadness and depression. To untie these knots. The next one that's an important teaching of the Buddha is the six senses. This is a very useful way of breaking down real breaking up reality into parts. I said this is what we do as as Buddhist meditators. First we break it up into these four parts, the body, the feelings, and the mind, and the Dhammas. And the, the Dhammas here, we're, we're going to get into more detail. We're going to use another classification, and that's the six senses. Seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, feeling, and thinking. Because this is where every reality arises. This is where the body arises. This is where the feelings arise. This is where our thoughts arise. This is where our emotions arise. All parts of reality have to arise at one of these six doors, the six senses. And so as we progress in our practice, this is the next, this is one of the next steps is to uh, break every experience up into one of these parts, to, to see it as one of these six things. When we see something, to just know that we're seeing when we hear something, to know that we're hearing, smelling, tasting, feeling, or thinking. So this is an important part of our practice as well. When we see something, instead of becoming attracted to it or repulsed by it, giving rise to a happy feeling and then a, an, an attachment, or an unhappy feeling and then a, an a, aversion towards it. We're here to untie these knots, to uh, extract ourselves from the mess, from the, the chaos that is our minds, that is reality. And to become free. This is the only way to fly, so to speak. And we're clinging to to real to the formed reality around us. And this is stopping us from the most important thing the most important realization, which is this freedom, the flying free. And when we hear something, when we smell, when we taste, when we feel, when we think, we, we, we we pull ourselves up and out and back to our center, back to our true nature, untying all of the knots. We say to ourselves, seeing or hearing or smelling, just seeing it for what it is, rather than getting upset or attached to it. There's a, a, a a dialogue that, a short dialogue that goes in, that occurs in the Buddhist teaching that is of great interest when we talk about Nibbana. 
And it's a monk asking one of the Buddha's chief disciples a question. He says, if Nibbana is free from from sensation, if there's no sensations in Nibbana, how can it be true happiness? How can it be said to be happiness? I think this is a question that's on all of our minds, really, when we come to practice meditation. Because we, we really like, this is where we think of as happiness, pleasurable feelings. We don't want to extricate ourselves. We don't want to be free from experience. We don't want to be free from seeing and hearing and smelling because this is where we find happiness, isn't it? And yet Sariputta's response was it is precisely because there are no feelings in Nibbana that it is true happiness. This is some sort of food for thought, I think, for all of us. And we can be really honest with ourselves ask ourselves whether we do really find happiness in these things. And I think the answer that comes to us in meditation is that we truly don't. And when we realize this, we extricate ourselves from the great mass of chaos and suffering. This is the path to Nibbana. This is where we're headed in our practice. It's not away and uh, outside of the universe, it's, it's in, it's the center of the universe, if you will. Everything else is external. Nibbana is what's left, and everything else ceases. So I'd like to thank you all for coming. I think I've gone on long enough, and I appreciate your, um, your attention. If you have any questions, you're welcome to ask. Otherwise, thank you.